My name is Simone. I am the head of programme at the barn and I'm here today with the lovely Christina Peak. Hello, Christina. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I'm really excited. Oh, wow. Well, Christina is, um, well, Christina is an artist who came on our sort of Becoming Earthly uh, learning space that we initiated earlier in the year. And since that time, she's been very, very, very busy doing lots of interesting things. She's had a, a, a commission at Turner Contemporary, mm -hmm. uh, lots of education projects going on, but she's also making um, a, a an installation and sort of... Um, kind of associated sort of content. Uh, it, this installation is called Gettin's House and it is, it's part of a new group of creative projects um, that have developed out of the Becoming Earthly learning space. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, as I said before, it includes an installation, an installation on site at the barn, accompanying digital content, including downloadable immersive walks, self-guided learning packs for all ages, and there's going to be other sort of activity around this. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to kind of um, have a bit of a chat with Christina today so she can we can get to know her a bit better and you can discover um, the thinking behind um, some of her work. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we'll do is we're going to start with the, a really, really obvious question, Christina. I think we should just start with you telling our audience um, what, what, what this project is about. <laughs> that sounds like a good start. That sounds like a good yeah. start. So I believe that this project gets into us. I think it's like, it's a number of things really so I think one this a lot of this is based um say out of my out of my heritage so my my mum is from Barbados um my father is English and I've, I've grown up um I think I've been gifted in the process by growing up within two different worlds but they've always been parallel for me um and there's so many kind of like stories and feeling and that relationship with the natural world in two different countries the the culture and families and communities and all these different things so I think this is a narrative that comes out in my practice but for Gesson's house I'm bringing that to this audience I'm bringing that to you so you're going to go into my imagination from childhood to adulthood there's going to be stories that are going to come out that I'm sharing with you ones that I think and I hope are intensely immersive because I can still feel them and see them in my head you know so I hope that those worlds and that imagery you know whether that's coral reefs whether it's the palette whether it's the sun and the colour comes out in that. And then, as you said, with the Becoming Earthly experience, that connected me so much to where you are um, within Scotland. And then just the fascination with, with, say, the Scots language, with Doric culture and heritage. And I saw so many commonalities because Barbados, you have the Scotland district. So to me, it was a place that I'd never been, but I had this connection where Gettins, who was a real person, who was a, one of my grand's best friends in Barbados, where they live. So it became this real place of, of imagination and folklore and just this supernatural kind of experience. So all of these things are going to be enacting that for us and for, and for you and for me, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, you, you, would you, you describe yourself as sort of a British artist of Bayesian heritage and you do often describe Barbados as this almost sort of mythic and supernatural yeah. place. And, and you started elaborating your, your thoughts on, on that. I, I was thinking um, Gettin, such a distinctive name. Was, was Gettin themselves a really distinctive character? Yeah, he was, honestly, he was like my grand's, my grand's best friend. So Gettin's house, which I'll tell you a little bit, you know, like yeah. one of the stories that relates to this very experience. I can feel it like it was yesterday. I remember I was probably about like maybe 12 or something. And we went up to Gettin's. So Gettin's house, as I said, is in the Scotland district. And it's called that in Barbados because it's, you know, it's hilly and the trees kind of like are bent by like the East Coast, by the Atlantic Ocean. So everything is just battered. And I think kind of the forms of everything from nature to maybe also the people as well and the culture and the way people art has this very kind of intense wild kind of nature to it you know so when i was at Gessie's house and we went to see the grand she hadn't seen him for a while she just went to look him up as she'd say you know and he's just this this kind of like old dude and his door would always be open and he faced the sea so from his doorway you could see all the way through down these kind of like down this kind of like semi-mountainous kind of feel all the way down to the atlantic ocean and you could just hear the roar of the sea and i always remember standing there while granny and him were talking and he was a very kind, very kind kind of fellow, very funny as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, see the grand turns up, it's just like, you know, 
I don't remember it been five years, five months or five days since they'd last seen each other, but it was always the same no matter what, you know, it's that kind of relationship. Um, and I just remember because he was close to my gran, um, he was, I automatically, I just always kind of like loved that about him because if someone was, you know, if they're an intensely close friend for a long time of a member of my family, whatever, as you have your own long-term friends, it was just always something that I always respected that relationship and they were so kind and caring with one another. And I, the last time that I remember seeing him was that day before he, um, before I think he passed away. And they just sat for hours and they talked and they talked and they talked and it was just the background of the ocean it was my mother being there and i remember just playing outside in the garden i just you know watching and listening to the sea and seeing all these trees and stuff while these you know these older people you know just shared a lot of their memories and their stories and i just you know when when the idea of coming up to do something for the barn came up i don't know just that imagery just popped into my head and that's where it kind of led to what i hope is all these kind of like worlds and experiences for everyone yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, it's going a bit off piece of what we were planning to say. But <laughs> I know. No, no, I think this is something really interesting because I, the way we like to work at the barn, uh, mm. a lot of the time we, we do a lot of performances and, and things, but we are actually a space where a lot of conversations happen. Mm. And um, when I look back at memories of my own uh, grandmother, who, who was French, um, I remember lots of great meals and lots of great conversations. It's in 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 really like natural natural settings outside in the garden and things like yeah. that. And it's it's that that people have really connected with um, throughout this sort of pandemic. The, those simple pleasures and exchanges with one another when they could, because it's become so so precious. But um, actually just sort of coming back to this Scotland district of Barbados, mm. um, is there any other reasons sort of why you've connected this project to this di district? Is it about on some level the sort of shared histories between Scotland and Barbados? Are you sort of seeking to uncover marginalised and silenced histories um, or figures or cultural moments within the project? Um, and where does that intersect with the sort of ecology or the ecological thinking within your practice? I think, yeah, so for this area of the Scotland district, and there is that shared heritage there. So you had many um, people from Scotland that like, came over to the Caribbean, specifically in this context, we're talking about um, Barbados. And there was a specific, you know, we found historical accounts when researching this commission of say, um, Jacobites traveling to Barbados, you know, some of the first settlers that, that came there. So I think historically, maybe from the, I want to say from the 17th century, we've had, you know, Scottish families um, in Barbados um, and part of that culture. And and when you have that there as well, my memories, again, when I heard gettings, when I'd hear my grandmother speaking, when I'd hear my mother speaking, is that the Scotland district was like where the last of the old world lived. So it was very much, again, it linked in with this kind of um, this supernatural char characteristic, but not just within the Caribbean, but then linking it to Scotland. That these are some of the kind of so, but actually in in the in the colonial context and settlement within Barbados, that these are some of the longest kind of lineages within within Scotland. But they stayed then within their own area. So it's very rare that you actually meet these people now. But they also have some of the the strongest strongest kind of Bayesian accents as well. So like that Patois dialect is so so intense that it's you know. Although I, I've grown up hearing that, that, that language and dialect, when I even listening to, and when we found like videos, like it's, it's really hard to kind of, for me to even to, to access that. So these, there's, a, there's a shared history there historically. There's a shared history there, I think also in terms of language of what that is. So as I've learned more and that, and that, that connected to the historic heritage and culture when I started learning about these ballads, these Bothy ballads and the way in which language is written, the way it's constructed, but also the commonalities between say um, the Scots language and when I think of Bayesian as well. So the way in which these languages or these dialects or and there's a lot of dialogue around that in and of its own, how these are, how these were used to subjugate and devalue people. But now I think in terms of when we think of heritage conservation um, and, and histories and identity and culture, these are now acts of empowerment, they're acts of nation building, definitely in Barbados, once, you know, which we had independence, that, that push in, you know, really in, in investment in what is that, that locality in your culture is really, really strong. And it's just been such a pleasure to learn that in this context, you know, within Scotland, within Thoric, within Scots, and, and doing all that research. 
Oh, that's really fascinating, actually, really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of your stories that you've got in the commission is called Red Legs. Was that sort of, is that sort of a type of uh, slang? Is it a slang yeah. insult? I would, I would say it was, I would say, yeah, it's the kind of like, yeah, vernacular or slang of that. So but the reason that I would hear the stories that you would hear of Red Legs, so you'd hear of like, you know, Scots in Barbados in the Scotland district is because of the because of the exposure to the sun their skin would go very almost kind of like a red kind of um, kind of color kind of thing is in like you know just very well seasoned very very tanned so that's how you would spot those that's how you would spot those people so they became like yeah the name was like red leg but as a kid and that's why it's one of the stories because I always this this was such a like strong visual image to me so when my you know when my grandmother and my mum was talking about it I literally as a kid would be like looking around going like well, who are these people? I don't know what they are. You know, like when you think of like some kind of, I don't know, some indigenous tribe that I thought was looking, had markings down their legs or something. Do you know what I mean? In the Scotland district. So it became this game for me as well. Do you know what I mean? That I could spot these people and where they were and why I'd never seen them. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, Barbados is so tiny. It's like 16 by 22 miles. It has to be somewhere where these people are. So it became this total kind of, I don't know this this kind of like community imagining community in my head that I kind of built so I, that's why I shared it as one of the stories because I think there's something quite comical and and fantastical about how children create you know whole lineage whole lineage and histories and like whole entire worlds around one kind of word you know what I mean so I just think it's extraordinary really so yeah I quite like the idea of red legs being being something mythic as well as uh, um sort of a group of people that are live in a, a very remote place and mm -hmm. it's interesting they they they've gone to the to the district that became the Scotland district because it sounded so like wild and yeah. it, is it anything is it because it reminds reminded them historically back all those generations ago of of, of home in some way I think I think maybe um I mean this is definitely uh me kind of speculating but I think maybe it's a little bit of that I think also, practically speaking, I wonder if there was some kind of like economics in it, because, you know, when you think of like, you know, the plantation systems and all those kinds of things, as soon as you're going into like hilly kind of, you know, that kind of geographic landscape, you know, this is also a place where because of the heavy salt content coming up from the sea and things, you know, it was a lot less agriculturally profitable than the plantations when you have a lot of the flat lying ground and things. So I wonder also whether this was areas where you know the most affluent occupied you know the places that were commercially very very viable and very you know conducive to the kind of colonial project whereas the scotland district was somewhere where it's very rural you know it's very, where a lot of local people are i can you know i, I think you know it's hard that you say this is where a lot of like Bajans live this is not where you get a lot of the hotels and things you know what i mean so it's kind of maybe in many people's imagination the real barbados so i think that in itself even deepens the fascination that you know this Scottish heritage is part of like kind of like a deeper kind of real kind of authentic Barbados in that way that you don't see very often you know unless you go and you search and you find out because you want to be you want to have that authentic kind of real experience of a nation and a people. That's really fascinating it's really interesting I think it would be really interesting for our audience to, to actually um I think for some of our audience it would be a, a real revelation that sort of indentured servants from Scotland were sent over yeah. to, to work on the plantations and you know that they they would you know they received the whip they you know they they they, they had quite difficult lives um although um although it was different to slavery because um, their children could be born free that's that was the but in terms of the day-to-day -day working on the plantations it was um very very similar life um but I know that's sort of like a, a, I think this this is a bit of a jumping off point. Um, but I, I think we've go back to the installation um, that you're going to create because the installation is, um, it, the installation itself, you've described as a children's playhouse, but also uh, a chattel house, which was the original mobile housing on the plantations. Um, and I, 
I, I, as I understand it, that chattel houses were built entirely out of wood and were assembled without nails and that this allowed them to be dissembled and moved from place to place. And the structure you're creating for the barn, I mean, you, you started thinking about this commission yeah. and creating the structure for the barn during lockdown, thinking I'm not going to physically be able to get up there. And you thought, right, I'm going to create um, this structure made with recycled materials and make it portable, make it like a, a flat pack, <laughs> it's for want of a better word. And I just wondered with that connection with chattel houses, was, was this actually a practical consideration purely or was this was that connection part of the conceptual underpinning for the work? I'd say it was both. So in so in regards to specifically the Chatter House, it's an architectural motif that re is reoccurring within my practice, I think. Um, it's somewhere there, as you said, it was like this kind of first kind of mobile housing, if you think, within Barbados in that way, where you could move from plantation to plantation, this thing could be taken apart, put in the back of a cart, and then you, you know, you'd be moving or wherever you are. Um, and today, you know, this is a really iconic, as I said, like, architectural motif within Barbados they're brightly coloured you know I mean like bright red bright, bright yellow green whatever and you know this you know whether you have the jealousy windows as well you know so jealousy windows are where you have like you know like kind of louver kind of windows at the bottom you know you have to put your head over the top if you want to see out do you know what I mean so and then you have these like sloping kind of hoods sometimes over them and they can be really really ornate like there's lattice work and everything depending on how old they are but the thing I love about them is that I really think these houses whenever I see them they wax and wane with like the with like kind of the expansion and contraction of families, you know what I mean? As you know, as children are born, they grow up, you have these add-ons in different places. So they're never, they're, they're very ad hoc in nature. You're never gonna have like a new build chapel house so that way where it just looks pristine. They always feel like they've been lived and generations have added to them, you know what I mean? Um, and yet they still sit there and sometimes you'll see them literally, you'll see like this huge five-star hotel and another one and then there'll be this tiny little chapel house with the little, you know, little lady sat in there. You know, he's just like, I'm never moving from my six million dollar you know sight on this stunning kind of beach I've been here you know so and then and honestly they get bored they get offered so much money because they're on this prize real estate and there's somewhere they're just like no you see this tiny little shower house in between them but I also think in them very practical terms as well you know be considering ethical and sustainable practices when my work is something that I actively embed so where I think about the materials I'm using I'm thinking about where they're sourced and I think that directly relates to this idea of the multiple uses of a home and the fact that they're deconstructed and then reconstructed according to the needs of the person that they're added on according to the needs of that family so in this context i was looking at and because as you said with with covid and lockdown i was making this out of material um and you know i contacted say companies and organizations where they where you have off cuts from like you know textile industry for example so you can just get you know you're just paying for the postage so i was going to erect this kind of you know, fabric based kind of version of this chattel house that is playful because of that, you know, we're making like a small version. Um, and this is something that I want children to be able to engage in. And again, it, it relates back to that childhood. So, yeah. So it's interesting, like, um, if you're going back to children hmm. and families, because I, I, the way I, the way you kind of pitched this commission, I really just thought, so people come through, there's an installation and, and, and within Yetin's house, stories are told and there are learning packs with yeah. different um, things to make and do in connection to those stories. And, um, and um, I think um, you, you've mentioned that most of these stories come from your imaginative childhood me memories. Um, and I was just thinking about sort of the, the genre and the style of these stories that are unfolding and how you as an artist um, imagine families will engage with these sort of tales and yeah. I'm hoping for any uh, unexpected responses. I, I want to make it clear to our audience that this is an installation for everyone, for yeah. little children and um, and adults who are big children at heart or something that in a way it's it's definitely it's not a, a thing that's targeted for for children but it's something that we believe that children would really um engage with because it's all about using your imagination and storytelling and I just wondered how you'd um how do you imagine families and children will engage with those tales well, like, I think, you know, when I first mentioned, like, where, where the idea for, you know, 
um, for this commission came from of getting this real person where you know you have two you have this intergenerational family sat there you've got the two uh, just you know conversing and then I'm standing there at the top of this kind of like you know semi mountain in my mind when you're like you know 12 years old or whatever it is um, looking out to see and, and this setting of it I think reflects that intergenerational engagement with this installation. So I'd say firstly, with the stories, I think they all jump up from this place. So Salt is a story literally of, of standing there, of, of this immersion within this place as I felt the wind and I, can, and I can hear the sea and I can hear my family talking. And I take you through that kind of, that almost feeling like you're flying when you're standing at the top of the hill and the wind is hitting you, do you know what I mean? As you, as I move through kind of literally like through this landscape in my mind as a kid or when I'm running around trying you know running through like the gullies or rainforest trying to find these red legs that are there do you know what I mean like this immersive experience of trying to figure out who these who these um people are that the big people are talking about you know when you're a child or the kite competition which you know so many stories my family will always used to be storytellers so one of my key memories as well is you know my grandmother and my mother You'd be seeing kind of like twilight kind of time you can hear the whistling frogs and the cicadas and you're chewing sugar cane and granny would tell you bible stories or telling me stories so this act of storytelling and the immersive quality of it is something that i really want to come through um so what i think one of the strongest stories as well that i'm really excited that i'm writing about is called the Geed. so this chattel house is not just going to end say at its foundation where it would usually be i'm going to be we're going to have the material stretching out across the floor where i'm going to hand paint like this coral reef so the story of the Geed is these kind of coral kind of spirits that are playful and tricks there within the sea that um, is one of my greatest, greatest loves. And so this, this really dynamic, beautiful, really saturated coloured environment is something that's going to be reflected in these stories. So the kids and, and people, whether you're sitting down and you're looking at it and you're listening to the stories, whether you have the characters that are cut out within the packs that are characters from these stories where um, because we have projections and we're really going to make this an immersive environment with the children running around and you know creating shadows acting out these stories as they're told um, or whether you're sitting like my grandmother and getting or you know and and having a conversation while you're within this within this place I think every level of every generation within a family or or group or however you're going to visit us um, will replicate I think that experience that I had and that my family had and, and bringing in as well that Scottish um the scots kind of thing uh, this connection in there as well so that's threading all the way through this so it becomes something very unique specifically just for us within that context i think actually in linking back to the scottish just to develop that a bit more you're working with um shane strachan who's an aberdeen based artist writer exploring the Doric language and storytelling connections um, um, within Gesson's house. And I just wondered if you could just elaborate a little more about this, because then there might be some really interesting connections that you've sort of uncovered together. And I think our audience would be really keen to see how the, the Scottish and the Doric kind of links in, intersects into this project um, through storytelling. Oh, definitely. Well, I think through speaking to Shane, like a couple of times he also kind of performed it for me as well, which was absolutely awesome. But learning about like learning about these Bothy ballads. So having someone that can share with it, not like the authenticity, the experience of it. And when I say the experience historically and also contemporary, the contemporary experience and how that culture is being lived. So we both are coming to each other with these kind of, you know, what I'd love to think are authentic voices of our heritage. And we're speaking and we're in dialogue with each other. I think you know that that whole relationship is acting out what's happening actually within this installation this commission so i'm i'm kind of sharing my experience of of barbados where the entry points are for me within scottish heritage within the caribbean but then also for me learning about doric culture and without the, about the scots heritage and from he, him also sharing with me like so many of those experiences that we touched on earlier about you know how it was how you may have been like, whether it was in school, for example, that that'd be something where you'd be told off if you spoke in, if you spoke in Scots, for example, if you wrote in a particular way, you know, that this was an act of something where you were actively, you know, discouraged from using it and what that was like. So I think those, those challenges, and then also, you know, his love of it shows, and I fix deeply that empowerment. And then I'm sharing the same thing. So I, want to, I wanted to make sure that I was deepening my understanding and my connection with this. Um, and he's enabled me to do that so much. And I think that goes both ways. Also, I love the imagery of it as well. So the terms say, of um, whether it's flora or fauna in the natural environment, these kind of 
you know, these tales of like community and people. So whether they're a bit cheeky and they're about love and a bit of flirting or something, or whether, you know, they're, their children's tales about, um, or you know, aimed at children. So if you're talking about, you know, the particular kind of landscape and things with flowers and dandelions and, and nettles or the color of a woman's hair as, you know, she ran away or something, you know, it's just like, it's, it's they're so evocative of community. And I think they're, they're so, there's so much humanity with them because they're themes that we all, we all have, do you know what I mean? Of love and lament and like kind of like moving through like the landscape that you love and like, and just the retelling and the performance of it just, automatically just deepens and embeds you again within the very heritage and the culture that you come from and there's so much pride and love in that so I'm hoping those things come through so those 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 that iconography that imagery I'm I'm absorbing within the symbolism within a lot of the kind of visual language within the reefs within um the telling of this of this commission so yeah I I, I hope it will be you will be evoking something really really quite deep and sensual and passionate and you know loving I think for, for kids and I especially after lockdown as well that they have somewhere that they can just play and, and experience something and play with something you know is, is great yeah no I, I think that's really interesting I think I think it's that thing the myth making um mm. uh and you know like we, there's this thing they say in ancient Greece um myth was a verb to myth mm. instead of just sort of storytelling being sort of a passive constructed narrative it was sort of very much embodied um which i think that that, that you, those two elements have captured really 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 well it's really interesting the one the one thing i'd like to touch on before we sort of round off is the fact that if you can't physically come to the installation um if you're shielding or it's too far away or um there are things you can download you've, you've created these sort of family walks and that you can download online so you can still kind of um, immerse yourself in this project. I mean, actually, you can go to the installation and download the walks as well. It's not one or the other. It's a, it's a, it's a whole plethora of stuff that you can do. But I just wondered, could you just um, explain a little bit about what those walks are and and, and how, how, how they're to be experienced? And um, yeah, that'd be really good. <laughs> Uh, so the walks to me, I think firstly, it's again, it's I think it's a key thing. So I, I know many of us in lockdown, you know, where the things you could do with say walking and there's so many ways, you know, this has been like, you know, last year was the year of nature because so many people have reconnected with it. So um, because because of how your world is restricted and having to find out and learn more and, and rediscover through repetition, maybe your local areas or your local territories, if you like. Um, so these walks that I have, um on there one because i'm not with you and it's also this idea that um because of lockdown as well i thought by by this by having this guided walk but actually but i'm i'm talking about a place um and about a landscape that actually you're not seeing but it's evoking in within your imagination somewhere where you're walking so where so again it i think it reflects this idea of within the commission where you where you have these kind of parallel worlds so you're walking within these lovely like landscapes around the bar which i've seen many times through Google Earth at the moment, you know what I mean? I was trying to, you know, imagine this, this kind of walking path. But then again, when I'm, when I'm telling that story, when I'm guiding that walk, I'm using iconography and imagery, say, from the Caribbean. So you're going, so it's like on two walks that you're, that you're, that you're having actually. And through that, I thought maybe it may spark and reframe or reorientate how you're actually viewing and seeing um, the landscape that you're walking through. I mean, I think all of the stories, basically, from from what you the point you made before, this idea of like two myth or creating the mythic. Um, every time, I think it's the same thing there, where we have that that single point of departure, and then everything kind of nebulously kind of jumps off from that point. So you know, whether that is um, whether that is when you start hearing that imagery and the iconography and, and that storytelling from me, or whether it is where you're in the installation, um, you know, and and you're seeing whether there's particular, I don't know, the way the house looks or where's a particular point within the story um, or the way, you know, the children may find that these characters are within the packs and then it just leads a complete creation of a whole other world. I know when I was a kid, it would be a story. I'd have one thing, one little thing like thinking of those red legs and I would create a whole world, games. I would create stories. They would then become collective experiences because my sister and anyone else who was around would then be drawn into it, do you know what I mean? Be given roles. And before you know it, it's a whole production and the National Theatre would be lucky if they had me there. <laughs> <laughs> because a whole dynamic experience. I'm just going to point a little bit. But that's the beauty of imagination. And that's, it's just, 
mm. in terms of play that doesn't stop just because we, you know, we're adults, it's like, I think reflecting all of that and just having that fun, but anything that opens your eyes to see something, to see something new or just reframe it, I think is always fascinating. So creating myth out of things you already know is actually a really humbling and I think quite, quite extraordinary experience, you know what I mean? Just re that rediscovery. I think is I think what's really interesting is I thought the walks were interesting before, but I think it's really interesting that these walks are coming in now at this time because you know we spent the whole last year everyone kind of saying to us, well, refamiliarize yourself with your place mm. and connect really closely and observe your place that you live in. And um, and I think that's really great. But I think there's this because we've been in this pandemic for quite a prolonged time now, and travel is going to be difficult for the foreseeable future um it's sort of like how do you travel imagine travel and travel to new places in your mind or in your memory and how can those sort of external influences kind of enrich the local specificity that you're sort of in Absolutely. and i think that's really interesting now at a time where we're things are allowed to open up we have a bit more um uh, room to go out and explore but yeah. we still it's still not sort of recommended that we travel too far and so actually kind of putting um, downloading the podcast of these walks and going on them at twilight with your family and hearing about a different place and connecting it to your place is going to be I think really illuminating and really freeing actually um for for some people I hope well we, I hope that's the intention um but um I I think there's so much rich stuff here we could carry on forever <laughs> like we could carry on all day you and I having a chat yeah, I know. we'll have quite a few times actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's just so always oh, just such a pleasure to hear about your practice and to really kind of get under the skin of it and um everyone Christina's um, installation sort of opens in July. We're going to have some content up um, around that time and maybe a bit earlier. And we really urge you to sort of book a ticket, come along, experience it, uh, take a pack, take it home, listen to the stories at home as well. Like you can and um, bring them yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, like say for example, the story Salt, if you find yourself on the beach and you and you can hear that on your like, you know, on your phone or something and you would get transported there and reimagine what that coastline is like for you, then that's great. But I would also say that, you know, this is a gift being able to produce this. I consider it a gift. And anyone who who is able to come and to join us, whether you download it or whether you can come to the exhibition, honestly, that is such a kindness. And I really thank you for taking and giving your time to to, to experience this. Um, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And to the barn as well. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary, beautiful gift to have an opportunity as well to just learn something new as well it's never just about the endpoints the whole journey and the production and how much you've learned it's just extraordinary well I'm not going to say much more because there's no better ending than that <laughs> it's, really, it's just really wonderful always a pleasure Christina mm. and we'll see you soon hopefully yes. in the real world together <laughs> oh my gosh yes absolutely I, I, you know what it would be so great if I could bring my son up there to see it but if not that's okay but if I ever could then that would be awesome but yeah Take care.